I've talked before about several different forms of leftist ideology, ranging from anarchism to communism. But today I want to take a chance to address the way that Fox News, Ben Shapiro, and many on the right talk about communism. And as a leftist, I want to take the opportunity to tell you that they're exactly right. Communism is evil. The rise of socialism has never been more clear. Here in the United States, we are alarmed by the new calls to adopt socialism in our country. We will have a nation in which all people have health care as a right. And socialism is alive and well in the United States and getting more popular, according to polls. I think socialism actually has a better PR person, and people who embrace capitalism have to marry it to creativity. 70% of American millennials say they'll likely vote socialist, and one in three of them view communism favorably. This socialist label is something that I think the media cares more about. Mm -hmm. The reason that it's become popular among young people is because they've been told that it is moral. Not that it works, not that it's great, but that it's moral. It's fair. And then we do stuff that's fair. And fair means what I like. Think about it for a second. Medicare, Social Security, uh, well, garbage that's... collection, the post office, the library. I agree with you. I, that's all well, I Democratic agree with you we, we, have... we all want free stuff. The Obama administration couldn't even launch a website. And you want to give the government more responsibility? And we all like things that are fair. If we're in a room and somebody has more money and somebody has less money, wouldn't it be more fair if we just pooled the money and then we split it up evenly among the participants? Free anything is awesome, especially if you believe that free anything actually exists. Now let's look at the facts about socialism, shall we? Venezuela. Let's send kids to places like Venezuela, Venezuela. where <laughs> they Cuba. learn, or Cuba, where they really can see firsthand. Socialist policies have turned that nation into a state of abject poverty and despair. Sick people are taking dog medicine. There's a massive toilet paper shortage, and it's now the murder capital of the world. America was founded on liberty and independence, and not government coercion, domination, and control. Uh, obviously, communism bad. Also evil, uh, also killed 100 million people. Same survey, 72% of all Americans wrongly believe communism killed under 100 million people in the last 100 years. It's more. So one of us got this wildly wrong, and I'm pretty sure it's not me. Move to Cuba and then tell me how wonderful communism is without being a part of the prevailing regime. And those are people whose private property was taken away by force. Doing whatever is necessary to make socialism happen. One of the most serious challenges our countries face is the specter of socialism. We used to know that vaccines saved millions of lives, but once measles is nearly wiped out, what happens? We forget and start talking about vaccines as an option, like a sunroof, then measles return. All the groundbreaking medical research happens in America because we have the freedom we have today. Thin the herd, as they say. America will never be a socialist country. We are born free and we will stay free. And for those of you who need reminding, socialism doesn't work. To explain why I can be a leftist who believes in the magical power of communism while also explaining that I believe that conservatives are correct, I'm going to need some help from one of my favorite philosophers. No, not him. Not him either. No, but... I'll see you later, handsome. No, today I want to discuss Ludwig Wittgenstein and the way he completely changed the game for all of human language. Wittgenstein is one of those historical figures who seemed only to grow in legend after his death. Wittgenstein was born in Austria in 1889 
to a family of Jewish descent but was raised Roman Catholic. Despite being raised as Catholic, there's a conspiracy theory out there that Wittgenstein was the exact stammering, precocious, precious, aristocrat little upstart that Hitler would later write about. You see, Adolf Hitler and Wittgenstein were born only a few days apart and actually went to school together in the years of 1903 and 1904. Now, there's no specific evidence that this is the person that Hitler was writing about. But it is worth noting that Wittgenstein had the reputation of kind of being an ass, so it's entirely possible. Keep in mind, though, that at this point in his life, his entire family identified as Catholic. So Hitler would have had very little reason to specifically refer to him as a Jew. Once in college, Wittgenstein had his goals set on becoming an engineer. However, he came under the tutelage of another famous philosopher from the time, uh, Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell is one of the key founders of analytical philosophy. And it's a portion of philosophy that most of us philosophical nerds like to avoid completely. The reason being is because it is very, very, very deeply entrenched in a philosophical love for mathematics. Hello darkness, my old friend. <sighs> now, I am not equipped with the time, patience, and likely even intellect to really dive into what's considered Bertrand's greatest work, Principia Mathematica but it is worth at least addressing briefly. Principia Mathematica was released in three separate volumes, and these volumes were written in a detailed, complex uh, form of arithmetic that set out to prove logical truths using mathematics. Bertrand spent the entire first novel laying out some very, very basic rules for these logical proofs that he was trying to create. And when I say basic, I mean really basic. It isn't even until the second volume that Bertrand gets to the point, after 500 pages of text that look mostly like this, that he feels confident enough to say a logical proof that 1 plus 1 equals 2. Bertrand would then say that such a proof can occasionally be useful. Thankfully, that's not why we're here today. You see, Wittgenstein looked at the way that Bertrand was approaching philosophy, and he wanted to take that exact same approach and apply it to language. In his early years, Wittgenstein looked at the questions that philosophers had been asking for centuries. What is truth? What is justice? What is the purpose of life? He looked at these questions and he said that the answer was that philosophers were using language to ask them. You see, Wittgenstein looked at language as like a crude tool, like a stone hammer. It was created by flawed humans. Yes, it has a purpose and it has a use, but it's very limited. To ask what is the meaning of life would be like asking why does the diameter of a triangle taste like green? You see, it sounds like utter nonsense. There's no way that you can answer that question. Now, to be clear, Wittgenstein believed that there were answers to these questions such as what is truth and is there a meaning to life? But Wittgenstein believed that because we use language, even in our thought processes, that we would never be capable of even thinking the answers. Even if we did discover the answer and we knew it internally, it's not something that we could teach to others. Now, Wittgenstein would go on later in his life to revoke many of the claims that he had made earlier. But one thing that remained pretty consistent was that Wittgenstein believed that language was a crude and inefficient tool. After all, Language has evolved over tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years, and its earliest form was little more than grunts and stick drawings on cave walls. I want to give you an example of a couple different English phrases that are being used perfectly grammatically correct, and point out something about that. 
Read rhymes with lead. Red rhymes with lead. But read and lead don't rhyme. And neither do read and lead. When said out loud, this sentence for the most part makes sense. However, when we view it written down, it becomes pretty clear that there's something very obviously wrong here. Another example is this. Colorless green ideas sleep furiously. This sentence was written by Noam Chomsky, and he wrote it in his thesis, The Logical Structure of Linguistic Theory. Now, the purpose of this sentence is to show that the sentence itself completely follows grammar rules. There's nothing about it that breaks with grammar. However, at every stage of the sentence, it's utter nonsense. It doesn't matter how you rearrange it. You can't be colorless and green. You can't be a green idea. Ideas don't sleep, and what even is sleeping furiously? Nothing about that makes sense. You see, what Wittgenstein recognized was that language has to have meaning outside of the rules that we create for it. Wittgenstein looked at questions like, what is justice? And said that it doesn't matter how we try to define justice. If we limit justice to one set of a definition, then there will always be exceptions to the rule, both cases for and against. Let's take the word game, for example. Everyone knows what a game is. However, as soon as you try to provide an all-encompassing definition, you begin to run into a problem. You'll have things excluded that definitely seem to be considered games, and you'll have things included that aren't considered games at all. For example, the Oxford English Dictionary defines game like this, a form of play or sport, especially a competitive one, played according to rules and decided by skill, strength, or luck. Have you ever played one of those idle games? They're not really a form of play. It's something that you do just to keep your mind busy. It's not really based on competition. It's definitely not based on skill. There's no strength, no luck. It's just idle but we all still consider that to be a game. To get around loopholes like this, Oxford includes an informal definition, a type of activity or business regarded as a game. But with that definition, literally anything can be considered a game if someone calls it one. Washing dishes, that's a game. A 30 minute commute to work, it's a game, honey killing 11 million people in a fascist attempt to purify the world? Yep, Oxford says that's a game too. So the next time someone gets mad at you for throwing a brick through a CBS window during a civil rights protest, just tell them, hey, don't get mad, bro. It's just a game. For legal reasons, that is a joke. So how does Wittgenstein think we should even define the game? Well. Wittgenstein thinks that we should look at a word and realize that it has a set of family resemblances. For example, my idol game might not have much in common with football, but it does have a pretty good amount of things in common with Fortnite. Fortnite is considered a skill-based competitive challenge. It's a game, and that has plenty of things in common with football. So while my idle game and football might not have much in common with each other, they do share a family resemblance. In the same way, you may not look much like your cousin, but you both share a family resemblance with your uncle. To Wittgenstein, it goes even further than this, however. When you take a word out of its sentence, what you're doing is you're taking the very life out of that word itself. You see, Wittgenstein realized something that my sixth grade language arts teacher, who would never, ever, ever, ever leave me alone for always wanting to say, can I go to the bathroom, ever did. Language is alive. All living things evolve. Language is no different. Evolution generally occurs through one of two ways, natural selection or random mutation. 
The less a word is used in everyday language, the more likely it is to fall off from use entirely. This is natural selection at work in language. Random mutation occurs when something quickly changes the way that language is used. An example of this would be, for example, Danger Noodle. When I said that, did you think of this, or did you think of Angry Lasagna? One of the most powerful examples of language evolving over time is the Old English text Beowulf. Now, there's a good chance that you took English literature and had the significance of this broken down for you already, but just in case, allow me to give you a refresher. You see, when most people hear the term Old English, they tend to think of the these and thous of Shakespearean language. But that's not Old English. Old English is much older than that. English speakers today likely wouldn't even be able to comprehend what an Old English speaker is saying. As these Old English tribes spread out further and further apart, unable to communicate with each other, they began to evolve separately. Both modern English and German are actually descendants of this language. And while English speakers and German speakers have a hard time understanding each other, it's not hard to look back at Old English and see the connection of the language. Now, it's worth noting that Old English changed over time and through turbulent, spontaneous mutation. Around 1066, Norway invaded the island of Britain and when they did, they brought language with them. The Old English transitioned into Middle English with influences from Nordic invaders, French, Vikings, and later on, Latin. The English language having such a turbulent development cycle is the exact reason that we have so many conflicting rules and exceptions to the rules in the grammar and language use of today. For example, the plural version of octopus is generally considered to be one of three things. Octopi, octopode, and octopuses. Octopi is generally considered to be the most popular one, but it's actually incorrect. Octo is a Greek prefix, and pi is a Latin suffix. And the rules of grammar dictate that we can't combine these. The grammatically correct plural of octopus is actually octopuses. But most people don't like saying it, so there's a decent chance that the natural selection will occur and octopi will become a new exception to the rule. However, it's worth noting that we have entered into the age of the internet, and this has completely changed the way that we do language. As much as it may seem like a joke, it's very likely that future historians are going to have entire fields of study dedicated to memes and the way that they influenced the way humans communicate. Having access to a unified digital zeitgeist of all forms of thought and communication has changed the way we do language. And with that, it might also be changing the way we experience the world entirely. In the 2016 film Arrival, a bunch of sentient octopuses come to Earth and begin to try and communicate with humans via complex ink circles. Humans find their number one language lady and send her to try and decipher what exactly the aliens are saying. Now, the entire world has their finger on the button and is ready to send these aliens their own personalized nuclear welcome to earth gift basket. But as our hero begins to learn their language, she begins to experience the world around her in an entirely different way. It in fact changes her perception of time. At the climax of the film, the governments of the world decide to do a war against the aliens and drive them off earth. But our star and hero begins to have a newfound understanding of the world. She comes away enlightened, not because she had any dramatic realization, but because she learned to communicate with a different culture, and it shaped the way she perceived time itself. The film borrows much of its premise from the Sapri-Waft linguistic theory of relativity. 
in a very, very crammed nutshell, the theory basically posits that when one is exposed to a language or culture, that that language and culture can completely shape the way we view and experience the world, even time itself. As an example of this, Benjamin Waft pointed out the differences between the way a Native American tribe, the Hopi, and British English speakers identified time. To English speakers, they would use cardinal numbers. One, two, three. The native Hopi people, however, used ordinal numbers to measure time. First, third, etc. So where an English speaker explains a certain amount of dominance and control over time by saying that it's one o'clock, the Hopi people don't objectify it as much and just identify it as the first hour. According to the Sapri Waft hypothesis, the subtle difference in the way these two cultures speak their languages is the exact reason why they would perceive the world differently. It in fact could shape the way they experience time itself. Now, we've already talked at length about how Wittgenstein felt that language was a clumsy tool. But there's one more thing that I think we can learn from this guy. I want you to imagine a box. Imagine that everyone on Earth has one of these boxes. And inside the box, that's what everyone calls the beetle. Now, no one can see inside of anybody else's box, so no one knows what's in anyone else's box. We all just know that we all call what's inside the box the beetle. Some people might actually have a beetle inside their box, but others might not have anything at all. Some people might have something completely random inside their box, like a 2007 Halo 3 Legendary Edition Master Chief helmet. Who's to say? But because no one can accurately define what the beetle is, talking about the beetle is basically pointless. Well, I've got bad news, folks. Everything is the beetle. Whether you realize it or not, every word that you speak comes with biases and prejudices associated with that word. A good example of this is the word queer. Now, most of us would define queer by saying that it is someone who, in some way or another, cannot be identified as heterosexual. What's different is the way different individuals experience this word. For example, older members of the LGBTQ community might experience the word queer with a bit of pain and sadness because queer used to be used as a slur against older members of the community. A homophobic person might experience anger, resentment, or even fear at the word. To younger members of the LGBTQ community, they might experience pride, even love, when they hear that word. All of these groups of people have the same definition of this word, but they come to the table with a different emotion and bias when they say it. Another really good example of this is racism. Now, to someone who identifies as liberal, the word racism might mean someone who burns crosses and says the N-word a whole lot. For fans of Tucker Carlson, racism might mean promoting equity rather than equality. It could also mean anything that shows favor to one ethnic group at the exclusion of another. For people on the left, and remember, liberal, by definition, is not on the left. For people on the left, racism generally means both prejudice and systemic inequalities that provide favor and benefits to one ethnic groups at the cost of others. As race itself is little more than a social political construct created specifically to identify and remove the rights and privileges of minorities. What's especially interesting here is that this has the opposite effect of the word queer. With queer, remember, the definition was the same, 
but it was the emotions that changed depending on which group was saying the word. Almost anyone who uses the word racism is assigning a bias to the word of anger and resentment, even disgust. But the definition is different with almost every single person. The lesson to be learned from the Beatle is that all of us bring to the conversation bias and prejudice to these words. And just because I say a word, it doesn't mean that you're going to have a same understanding of that word as I do. So when we talk about extremely complex ideas, it's important that we understand that sometimes it's at our best interest to abandon the labels and discuss the descriptions of what it is we're trying to express. Now, let's take all of these concepts and combine them together and see what we get. One, language is inefficient. It was created by ancient humans and has evolved over time and has plenty of flaws. Two, language is fluid. It doesn't stay the same. What a word meant a hundred years ago is not going to be what the word means to people today. Three, language shapes the way we view the world. The environments that we grow up in will teach us what a word means and will assign the biases and beliefs to that word that helps the way we perceive the world itself. And four, words have unspoken bias. Every single word that we say generally comes with its own history of our association with that word, all the different contexts in which we have used it, and that has influenced what we mean when we say it. So knowing all of this, let's finally examine the topic of today's video. Are conservatives right about communism? Yeah, kind of. Now, conservatives and I don't have the same definition of communism, but what's important to understand is that they're coming to communism with an identification of it that it was created by over a hundred years of propaganda. You see, to conservatives, socialism is when the government does stuff. And it's more socialism, the more stuff it does. And if it does a real lot of stuff, it's communism. Now, it doesn't matter whether or not that's my definition. As soon as I tell a conservative that I'm a socialist, that's what they assume I believe. And they're likely going to have a lot more attachment to their definition than they will to mine, no matter how much I try to explain. Personally, I find socialism to mean when a community of people pool their resources in order to create a better society, whether that's by funding infrastructure, transportation, healthcare, fire departments, and even law enforcement. And to me, communism means when the workers are completely in control of the business. It doesn't matter if this business just functions the way a co-op would function today. All that matters is that the business is run by workers and there's no need for wealthy CEOs. The profits and the power goes to the workers rather than some unassigned person at the top. There's a huge amount of variety that can be accomplished within that definition. Oppositionally, capitalism, defined by conservatives, is all about freedom. Specifically, capitalism means having the freedom of choice within a market. Now, personally, I recognize that capitalisms and markets are distinct from one another. You can have a market without it being capitalist. Capitalism for me just means that a society is based on capital and private ownership. Private ownership here meaning that wealthy individuals can use their resources to further empower themselves and weaken the working class. Great example of this would be climate change. We've known for decades that it's happening, but have been unable to stop it because of a handful of people and their power and influence through capital. What's fascinating in my experience is that when I discuss my ideology 
with a working class conservative, if I skip the use of labels entirely and I just begin to talk to them about how I believe in workers' rights and how I think that we should all have equal say over how our companies are run, they begin to see my point. It's no longer some ideological war between communism and capitalism. It's something that they haven't heard it described as before, generally. I grew up in a Republican evangelical Southern household. Almost everyone that I grew up around existed in this sort of bubble. And within this bubble, we all voted Republican, we all went to church on Sunday, and we all watched Fox News. Now, it's easy inside of this echo chamber to get used to a certain idea and definition. So challenging those ideas as an outsider, you're at a disadvantage, especially when such media outlets such as Fox News have spent so much of their time trying to demonize leftist ideologies because that's what's in their best interest. The entire language ecosystem that I grew up in was hostile to leftist ideology. The only history lesson I ever had on Karl Marx had all the nuance of Karl Marx is a scary looking man who made the worst idea ever of all time. Killed a whole bunch of people. Remember that language shapes us. So when we hear terms like the free market, we're programmed to like that phrase because to us, we like freedom. We like choices within a market. A lot of us even like shopping for some reason. And then when we hear other phrases like the abolition of private property, without a proper understanding of what that sentence is trying to say, it can be scary. In my experience, this is something of an Achilles heel for the left, understanding this and relating this to other people. It's not uncommon for someone on the left to commit the no true Scotsman fallacy and say, that's not real communism. And while they're not entirely wrong, they're quickly mocked by conservatives who've ingrained that definition so deeply that not real communism has kind of become a meme. However, there is an advantage here. The weakness of those who've kind of created this propagandized version of communism is that they can only attack the word itself. You see, they'll spend hours saying that communism is evil. Uh, obviously communism bad, also evil, <laughs> also killed 100 million people. But it's very, very rare that you'll find a conservative who legitimately will wrestle with Karl Marx's actual ideas and proposals. You see, generally they'll say, look at Venezuela or look at the USSR, that's evil. But there's so much that they have left unsaid. They're just trying to communicate to you one explicit version of a thing that they've created. To go after Karl Marx's ideas as they were written means that they would have to break the echo chamber that they've spent so much time carefully crafting. Generally speaking, any time that I've spoken with someone in the working class who identifies themselves as a right-wing conservative, when I ask them why it is that they hate leftist ideology, They'll generally give me reasons, such as authoritarianism. They'll point to human rights atrocities committed by the USSR or by China. And while often these ideas are based in some amount of exaggeration and propaganda, there is a kernel of truth to them. And it's worth noting that being opposed to authoritarianism is not the same thing as being opposed to leftist ideology. I want to make one thing perfectly clear. When I say that conservatives are right, I'm specifically talking about working class conservatives because the politicians and the millionaire talk show hosts who tell you that communism is evil, it's likely that they actually know that they're not saying the entire story. 
They know that they're not grappling with Marx's ideas. They know that they're not engaging in good faith with the arguments posited by the left. But when you engage with someone in the working class, it's very unlikely that they have, to at least to the same extent. But in my experience, when you engage with someone who's a member of the working class and discuss with them why you find these ideas compelling, rather than using the labels and just working from how you define these ideologies, I tend to have much more success. The good news is that language is changing now faster than it ever has before. With most people having access to the internet today, people across the world are able to exchange ideas and philosophies at a much faster rate than they ever were capable of before. This gives us a chance to redefine how we see these words outside of how our culture raised us to see them. I believe this is exactly why the so-called young people that conservatives are talking about do find socialism favorably because they've had a chance to see it outside of the definition that was created within the American culture. It's not because we're ignorant. It's not because we're rebellious teens. It's because we are now aware of a different way to look at the world, thanks to the digital age. So personally, I don't care if we call it communism or socialism, Marxism. The label doesn't matter to me. To me, what matters is communicating the ideology behind the label. If you need to call it capitalism 2.0 to get the attention of conservatives, do it. Personally. As someone who grew up in one of these right-wing echo chambers, but now identifies as someone on the left, I find a personal responsibility to try and breach the echo chambers of the people that I know. Why? Because to me, that's how I define solidarity. Thank you so much for watching. This video is the first video in a series that I'm already halfway through writing. The second part is going to be about the history of communism in America. I know I tend to take long gaps between videos, but I do expect the next ones to be out soonish. I don't know. I'm just kind of making this up as I go. I'm not going to compromise my own mental health or my own personal time for what I consider to be a hobby. Algorithm be damned. But I do hope you hit that subscribe button and I do hope to see you on the next one. I'm very much looking forward to it. Thank you so much for your time and watching this. I hope you have a great day. Be good to yourselves, be good to each other, and above all, don't let your life go unexamined.